in the back, good, okay. Welcome to One Million Cups Tulsa. This is our first Wednesday morning. What is One Million Cups? One Million Cups is, very simply, it's a, a group for entrepreneurs whereby we can come learn from each other, ask questions, and encourage one another. It's very simple. We meet here every Wednesday morning, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock. We encourage you to bring your friends. Uh, I've explained it to some people who aren't entrepreneurs and they don't understand entrepreneurs. I say it's a support group for entrepreneurs. It's just easier to say it that way. All right. The format today, we have two entrepreneurs get up and present for six minutes each. Then we open it up and from there, 20 minutes of question and answer. And that's where we push it back to you guys, the community, to basically rip them apart. No, I mean, help ask questions that encourage them and move them along in a, in a nice way. Uh, feel free, because we only have one microphone, just raise your hand and then we'll, we'll point you out and if you want to shout it out, we'll repeat the question on the microphone. Um, so that said, sort of some house rules. When the companies are presenting, let's focus on them because when we get to the 20 minutes of question and answer, we'd really like the questions to be educated rather than, can you repeat the part on what you actually do? Because, uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, just to intro the team, the community organizers, I'm Tim Vickers. Uh, all of our team, we've got four, we're all entrepreneurs and we all volunteer to do this. We've got Brad Post over here, Brad's an entrepreneur, and then we've got Justin and Katie Carpenter there, uh, also baristas, they're back behind the bar, and they, uh, they are allowing us to use their space as well. So we're thankful to Foolish Things Coffee for that. We're also thankful uh, to the Kaufman Foundation for bringing One Million Cups here to Tulsa. And then the last thing is, uh, we just asked that this is Justin and Katie's, this is their home away from home. Uh, so if they invite you over for dinner, we wouldn't want to trash their living room. Let's, let's just pretend this is their living room. Let's try to keep it clean. All right, first company today, first entrepreneur for One Million Cups, Tulsa. I want to introduce you to a company called Hilo. They used to go by Hilo Strap, if you're familiar with that. And they produce some very interesting products uh, that were designed here in Tulsa. And now some of the biggest companies in the world, yeah, she's got one on her iPad right there. One of the biggest, some of the biggest companies in the world use their, uh, their products corporately. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Paul Wisikowski with Hilo. Uh, wow, good morning. Uh, I, I realize I've only got six minutes and I've got time myself, so let me start the clock. <laughs> wow, this is going by fast, I'm sure. How exciting is this, right? Entrepreneurs getting to connect with other entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm really excited about this forum. Uh, and uh, first, I just want to say thank you to Tim and to Brad and to Foolish Things for helping make this happen. Uh, this is going to be great for the Tulsa community. Well, let me jump right in. Uh, I'm Paul Wisikowski, and I founded Hila, which is a small manufacturing company that produces straps for tablets. Pretty simple idea. Uh, I was one of the first people. Uh, one of the early adopters, I should say, of iPads. And uh, one of the first things I noticed was, this is really awesome. And then crap, I dropped it. Uh, and so uh, it's also a slippery and level. Right? Uh, so how many in the room have an iPad use a tablet at all? OK, so a few people, customers potentially here in the room. Uh, how many of you have dropped the iPad or come close to it? Right? So you can recognize the need, uh, as I did. So uh, Hilo's a bit of a slow burn company as far as startups. I started uh, about three years ago and spent that time developing this product, uh, expanding our product lineup, uh, moving uh, the way we manufacture it uh, from here in Tulsa to New Hampshire and now over into China uh, for all the obvious reasons. Uh, but it's been an incredible learning curve. Uh, so with that, let me start getting into the specifics about what we offer and what we do. Uh, Hilo is a company that produces, oh, at the very end, fantastic. This is why you test things before you go on stage. All right, so Hilo Strap. This is our product that we have uh, just launched this year. This is the culmination of several ideas and developments of design that we're really proud of. Uh, this strap in particular uh, includes uh, a really nice hand strap very, uh, that is padded. Ergonomic. It's designed to cut to your hand, uh, and, and you see the strap folds over so you can secure it pretty tightly to your hand. Uh, the base layer is, is, uh, is reinforced, so it's not going to give and sag on you. It's going to hold tightly to the back of the iPad. And, and then on each end, you see that the elastic loops that hug the corners 
Uh, this for us is, is a really special idea. Those are removable and so that they can be switched out to different lengths. We sell different length loops so that you can use them on different tablets. We've expanded our reach beyond the iPad to any 10 inch tablet that's out there. So suddenly the, the Microsoft Surface, the Galaxy Tab, all of those are now supported by our product when we uh, redesigned our loops. And then we added a, a silicone base layer to them so that the uh, the, the loops don't slip and slide. Yeah, they, they're really nice grip to them. Uh, so that is our strap. This is the Tablet Strap 360. Like I said, we've expanded our lineup to include a pretty broad range. Uh, one of the first things that we've uh, learned uh, as we've tried to reach out to distributors and retailers is they don't want just one product, they want multiple products. And so we've tried to expand that lineup to meet those needs. Uh, this is what we launched with uh, a couple of years back. I saw one of the room that's exciting to see. Uh, and uh, we have just redeveloped that one, retooled it to include some of the new designs like the removable loops. Uh, this is the Hilo strap, uh, and so it now supports 7 inch tablets and 10 inch tablets. This is a big move for us uh, in that the market has expanded to really adapt, uh, adopt rather, 7 inch tablets. And uh, so we've, we've been able to, to easily uh, manufacture. Uh, a strap for it uh, without it being cumbersome on, on our ways of doing things. I just talked about the Tablet Strap 360. This for us is kind of our middle tier uh, product. Uh, and it's what we're seeing the most success with. I fully expect this to be kind of our, our anchor, if you will, in terms of uh, sales. Um, and then we have a, a high end version of that, uh, a Tablet Strap Pro, which is made of a really nice premium leather. And so there's certainly an audience for that, uh, but what we really feel is, is that is a great anchor to uh, sales back towards the 360. Um, uh, we can talk about that in a little bit, but for instance, that is our, our lineup. This is what we have, and we're working to expand beyond that. Okay, so the key to all of this for us is the elastic loop set. Uh, and I've got some here in the back for you guys to check out. Simple idea. Uh, yet it's what separates us from other manufacturers, from case manufacturers that they have a strap on it, or just other strap manufacturers. There, there are a few out there, but most of them are a, uh, this size only fits with one tablet. You've got to switch out if you want to use a case. And you've got to, uh, or maybe it doesn't work with a case, or you have to use their case. Uh, our elastic loop set is what allows you to use our strap, our product, with any case or tablet combination that you may have already makes it very versatile, and that's a big selling point for us. So some of the positives about Hilo and, uh, is we just had a patent allowed by the U uh, US Patent Trademarks, or USPTO, and uh, you know that's a big deal. It was a, a two-year endeavor. Uh, we are in the final stages of, of, of working out the, the verbiage with our lawyer, but essentially it's been allowed, and, and so we're really excited to get that wrapped up and, and officially have a patent. And, uh, Another big thing about us uh, with Hilo is, is our product as a strap is an additive product. And by that I mean you can use it in conjunction with your case uh, or your screen protector, which are what people typically think of when they think of protecting their tablet. Uh, and so we're not competing with a really dense market. We're trying to add to that market and expand. Uh, so we're really, uh, and because of that, we think there's a significant opportunity for growth. Uh, most people think of a case when they buy a tablet. It's almost a, a no-brainer. Uh, but our, our goal is to expand that thought and say, you know what, what if you didn't drop it in the first place? I've that. All right, time's up. Oh, fantastic. We're going to open up for questions now. We have a question Sure. We have a question here. Go ahead. Uh, researchers identified that three options are perfect. What's your price and tickers? Uh, so we've got the three products, and he asked, what are our uh, pricing? Uh, we've got a, our base Hilo strap is $19.95, the TS360 is $34.95, and then the TS Pro, which is in leather, is $59.95. And so that falls in line with a lot of case prices. Um, so we were trying to match uh, price points of other accessories in the market. I'm cheap? No, too cheap. Too cheap. Charge more. Charge more. Well, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, good question. How are we getting a distribution? Uh, that's something that we're really needing to expand. Uh, we sell um, on our website, shophilo.com, which we just launched this uh, last month. 
so that's been a primary source of uh, sales. We run Amazon.com, which is a no-brainer. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it, but it's, it's a necessary evil for everybody who goes to buy their accessories. Uh, and then we do have a, a handful of representatives that, that help sell to uh, companies. Uh, we work with a gentleman uh, who has done this his whole life. He, he sells directly to large uh, companies. Uh, and so we're just one of many products that he sells throughout his network. And uh, that's been a great relationship. Through that, we've sold to uh, wholesalers and distributors around the world. We've sold uh, recurringly to Singapore and Thailand and Japan. We've been into England and Germany. Um, and we've got two different uh, places here in the States that, that uh, we've been with, uh, Focus Camera in Brooklyn and Accessory Geeks uh, in, on the West Coast. Um, so just trying to build that further. Where do you go to the big box, do you think? Say again? Do you think you'll go to the big box store? That is a goal of ours. Yeah, going to big box is, is the challenge in that we didn't have a big enough lineup of products. They really want a, a broad range of products to pick from. And you need an intermediary. An intermediary. You need a, a, someone that's going to get you to a distributor. And that person we've not found yet. We've talked to a couple, but not made it happen just yet. Can I just Yes. Yeah. How, how long do you estimate the last end will last? And what's the process to replace Sure. Uh, with the first part of that question is how long do the elastic beams last? Yeah, very good. And, and so, uh, we, I would say six months to, to a year, depending on how much you use it. And, and by that, I mean how much you take it off and put it back on. Uh, I, I leave mine on my iPad all the time, and, and it hasn't given out in the last year that I've been using it. Um, and so the next question is, how easy is it to replace? How do you get more? We sell those also on our website. Uh, we sell the elastic loop sets for $4.99 uh, themselves. And so it's a, it's a set of four different lengths of loops. And when you buy the TS360 or the TS Pro, uh, we give you an elastic loop set. So you've got essentially a second set with you to purchase. Don't stop. <laughs> uh, so the question was, what have I learned about myself uh, about this? One, I've learned that uh, I really am an entrepreneur. Uh, it's been very fulfilling to push through a lot of these challenges and find success. Uh, and it's been a great catalyst to connecting with people. My relationship with Tim has been started with, with Hilo. Uh, and uh, that's been exciting. Um, more specifically, I guess, it, it, it's, it's I come from an advertising background. Uh, I've been in, in um, producing commercials for the last 12 years of my life, and so this is a very different side of the brain. You know, manufacturing and negotiating, and you know, uh, uh, building relationships with manufacturers. It, it's a whole other set of skills that I've never developed, and it's been really exciting to do so. It's been a challenge with my limited time, uh, but uh, I think that's what everybody's got to push through. You know, that's why we're all here, right? Is to, to figure out how to do that better. Beyond just people who have iPads or tablets, yes. who's your target audience? Who's my target audience? Beyond the tablets? No, no, just beyond generally people who have iPads. Sure. Um, in my mind, well, the simple answer to everybody with a tablet, um, you know, uh, in my mind it's the business person. It's somebody that's going to be using this in an office on the go, uh, um, you know, traveling back and forth. And, and more specifically that point, I'm really excited about that selling directly to businesses that are rolling it out to their yeah. entire team. Uh, we've done that several times uh, this summer. Uh, Georgia Pacific bought a pretty large order to roll out just internally to one division of their team. And so that for us is a big opportunity to expand on. And, uh, we want to, to hit trade shows, not necessarily consumer electronics shows, but business specific. So uh, we think the education market where schools are rolling out tablets is a big part. We think um, obviously business in general, but uh, like the medical field, this is a big, uh, I think there's a big opportunity there. Uh, the challenge for us is just where we find them, where are those conventions, and how we plug in. And, and we're going to figure that out this next year. Question in the back. Uh, I work with high school kids, and I see a lot of the younger kids than that, children, mm -hmm. using tablets now. And so is there any kind of market? Uh, strategy for you to cater to my three-year-old son who might want to play uh, an iPad game or whatever is this? That's a good question about uh, do we have any plans for specifically marketing to children? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, 
I think that my, my focus needs to be on, on the business side of things right now. Um, I have two young boys, and, and you know, anytime they've got the iPad, you know, the strap's on there, and they hold it, they carry it around with it. Uh, and so it's, it's a tremendous uh, need there, uh, you know, just giving those little hands something extra to hold on to, uh, that I would love to, to find a way to market to. Uh, right now, I feel like I'd be dividing my focus. Yes, uh, I believe so. I'm going to reinforce this question. Yeah. Okay, you should be thinking about this too. Fundraising, schools, and college. Mm -hmm. That would be a huge part of that's, that's a great idea. It was a comment of uh, using this as a fundraising tool or product that you can use with schools. Is that right? Is that what you're yeah. And, and to that point, it's, it's on the board of things to pursue. Uh, I don't have a relationship with like a, a, a fundraising entity or a Product. Yeah. There we go. Let's do that. Like uh, from the beginning, uh, the design or the what things did you choose to use to try to outsource? Okay, so let me go back real quick to this slide of all the products. And uh, this is the first strap was one that I built myself, right? Um, it's a very simple idea where it's just a single one inch strip of nylon. Uh, and uh, that was what I built on my own. You know, with the Hobby Lobby and bought a sewing machine and just you know, taught myself how to build a strap. Uh, a lovely little crude, horribly looking uh, strap. Uh, so but, but from that, I, I developed you know, the ability to rotate it and, and, and have it assemble it. I outsourced and, and, and hired a product designer to do something that was much more ergonomic and much more aesthetic. And, and through that relationship, we built the design for the 360 and the Pro. Um, now, uh, and that designer is here in Tulsa, so I worked with her to, to do all our prototyping and sampling. Um, she's phenomenal. And um, so, yeah, that's your question. Okay, great. How do you find your startup model? I have a business partner. Uh, his name is Drew Reese. Uh, he couldn't be here this morning, uh, and so he has been instrumental in helping get this kicked off. Um, and, and so we've been, we've been, in a sense, still bootstrapping it. Uh, we've only been able to cover so much ground at a time. But uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty small capital. Well, what are your current needs, resources, capital, otherwise? You know, capital is a big deal for us, and, and, and the need ebbs and flows. You know, there, there's moments like we had this summer where I had three large orders, and, and all of a sudden didn't have enough product in hand. Uh, and so that was a challenge to overcome. Uh, we did so uh, by just negotiating, staggering the delivery times. Um, I could see that being a need as this takes off, uh, particularly as we build a relationship with distributors. Uh, you know, the, the order quantity would be more than I can sustain right now. Um, so twofold, how can people help is uh, relationships with distribution. I, I don't have them. Uh, and more importantly, uh, and consulting on those kinds of relationships. You know, I'm not sure what a, a, a good deal is. Uh, I, I can you know, run numbers and know what works for me, but in terms of what is really uh, successful, uh, I could use input. Uh, and, and capital is probably a secondary thing to that. Uh, that might just be the TV. Well, I mean, why, why, why is Oh, there? I'm sorry. It's the accent. Gotcha. Uh, to stress, VE is a he, hello, and not a hello. Um, <laughs> I'm sure what the term is, but when you, you know, uh, phonetically write out how you say a word, it's uh, worth stressing it. Uh, and, and hello is short for helicopter, at least in the air. Uh, it's a enduring effect. The rubber blade spinning is indicative of rotating. Uh, how many people do you currently have on your team, and what point are you going to expand? It's me, and it's my wife, and it's my eight-year-old son. <laughs> and as soon as capital will allow, uh, we, we outsource parts uh, along the, the chain. Uh, yeah, probably the next step that we'll outsource and find a, a, an answer for is fulfillment. We've talked with uh, Shipwire and Amazon, we uh, have fulfillment houses. Uh, yeah, th that's a bit of an unknown, um, just we need to get our, our sales up in terms of consistency. You know, because we're, we're caught in between a lot of individual sales, where we have a lot of one-off shipments every day, versus you know, an order of 500 that we've got to ship. And so I'm not entirely sure what my more pressing need is. I um, thought it was interesting. Yesterday, I had a local engineer company out to my house. Obviously, we came through to that for 
this. The salesman or the, uh, the guy came in to check the heater and had his tablet and threw him on the seat. He took off the iPad. He didn't want to make a call. Yeah, what was the name of that? Uh, Air Cover Solutions. Air Cover Solutions. <laughs> No. <laughs> I love it. I mean, and those are stories that, that, that continually happen when I hear about, you know, the challenges connecting with them and finding the right person that would make those kinds of purchases. So, thank you. Uh, Paul, you said your designer local which is awesome. Yeah. What's your experience in trying to get that manufactured locally oh. and then eventually all the way to China? Is there anything outside of just cost? Um, no, cost was, was it, and, it, and it's a big one. Uh, I mean, we hear about it, and it's almost a point of cliche, you know, the cost of uh, manufacturing here versus overseas, uh, and, um, you know, to the point that it was nearly 700% more expensive here than overseas. Uh, you know, it's a simple little strap. I mean, there's not a whole lot of material in, in this idea. It's all sewing time and, and, and how you, you know, combine the, the two pieces together. It's a real simple idea, so it's all labor. Um, and uh, I, I, I had a company here in Tulsa manufacturing the, the inside, the insert, the, the, I call it a plate, but you can't see, it's what reinforces it so it doesn't sag and bend on you, um, here locally. And then I had a company in New Hampshire assembling it all together, packing it up and sending it to me. And, and, and add all those layers up, it was uh, just unsustainable. Uh, and so uh, I knew of a gentleman that manufactures overseas and I paid him to consult introduced me to the factory there and walked me through uh, two rounds of importing, manufacturing with them and importing it, so now I, I can go along so. I just kind of comment on the next question. Is, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It, it's more of just a comment than a question. Sure. Is, it sounded like the two things that you said to me, uh, and then the third auxiliary of funding, that the gentleman that you have that's your factor mm -hmm. is more of a funding than a idea man or connections. And I think that it sounds like it's a choice and a market that changes a little bit of whether or not to go slow and learn yourself and develop those distribution channels yourself or take a small piece of a bigger pie and try to get a, a VC type of investment that brings in not only money but brings in the knowledge and relationships. So what would you do? Me, I would go and take a smaller piece of a bigger pie. Yeah. Because it's such a risky, changing, constant evolution of competition. Yeah. So if you do believe that you have uh, something that's unique, you have to get it. Yeah. And it's a very timely sensitive thing. If you are able to someone who does have those relationships and get it on the shelf or someone else figures out how to make something uh, similar enough that outside of the patent range that you have. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't disagree with you. I, I would say, you know, I've kind of been on the fence of, of pursuing both options as reality happens. You know, there, there are moments where um, I feel like I can handle it. I've got it taken care of. I'm gonna write this thing out. And there are moments of, man, I could really use a relationship here, and I would give up a percentage to figure that out tomorrow. Um, and, and so it really comes down to the right person uh, and the relationship. Uh, and uh, if I, I would definitely sit down with somebody that, that had those relationships. Well, thank you. So I think one of the things we kind of have the funding side, I think you're going to struggle with that. They were a super product to get any kind of funding in that way. Okay. I would really consider looking at, I think you are already looking at, really considering a specific niche of the market. Mm -hmm. So looking at something like uh, UBS or social work delivery service. Essentially, the idea was, it was to pursue uh, a corporate 
entity to, to, to partner with or to get deals with instead of a lot of the individual sales and that, that would boost our value and, and, and make us more likely to get funding. Um, which I don't disagree with and I would say we're shifting that direction. You know, as a small company I'm just ready, trying to be ready for anything. <laughs> Um, and, and, and this summer, we've seen that corner turn with a lot of relationships developing with large companies placing large orders. Um, you know, I mentioned Georgia Pacific earlier, which you know ordered several hundred, uh, which was a fantastic order, and followed up by another order right behind it from uh, you know a company in Belgium. It's essentially the AT&T in Belgium, you know, ordering several hundred for their uh, team, uh, followed by yet another company. And so, you know, I definitely think that that is the model of success for us is, is focusing on those larger entities. Um, but finding out who does the software for ESO, who does the software for who does the software for yeah. the So that's a big deal, relationships. I feel very much, as I'm sure we all do, in kind of a one-man band locked in my room, uh, figuring this out at night. And uh, so anyway, uh, that, and, and then secondly, just talk about a social I could really use just that local buzz that I'm sure we can all use. Uh, you know, a simple little like, a simple little uh, tweet, um, you know, uh, post a comment about what you think of us, the good, the bad, the ugly. I'd love to hear it. I really do want to get better at uh, making these products and, uh, Better as a business model. Well, so, 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 I want to introduce real quick, and they left, um, but we want to give a huge shout out to Foolish Things for allowing us to use their facility. Um, so if we could give them a hand clap. <laughs> We want to thank the Kaufman Foundation for allowing us to bring this here to Tulsa. And just a couple of uh, buzz things real quick. Um, we've got our Twitter feed here, at 1 million cups, T-U-L, um, or hashtag 1MC, T-U-L. So we want to encourage you to do that. Um, I know uh, a lot of people, Paul is on you know, every social network, and same with our next speaker coming up. So connect with them there, give them a shout out. Um, also, we've got uh, his, his hashtag here, at Hilo Products, and, and then our next speaker is going to be um, Nerval, and we'll talk about them here in a minute. Um, right now, for speakers, we're booked through November, but we're looking for more speakers. So if you are interested in presenting at One Million Cups, it's every Wednesday morning here at 9 o'clock. Um, you can go to onemillioncups.com backslash Lisa, and there's a uh, request to uh, present. Um, but also, I'd like to thank uh, Topeka Coffee, and I'm going to give uh, Mitch the mic for, uh, he's got a few seconds to, uh, to just kind of share what Topeka is doing. So, uh, so just glad to be able to serve you guys and kind of uh, energize the movers and shakers here in Tulsa. Uh, real quick, just, I uh, don't know if you know our, know our story, but we're a local out of Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma, and um, recently just got a lot of good reviews uh, online for mainly this coffee here, but we also up for a good food award for another one of our coffees. Uh, just a little thing about our company. We are leading right now in the direct trade industry in coffee with what's known as a seed to cup model, where we actually control every aspect of coffee from the planting at our own pit plantations in El Salvador all the way to when we roast it. Um, it's really unique when we do the worlds that do it, and uh, we're glad that we're able to reach the Tulsa and share with you guys. Up front, so if you guys want to sit down up front, we've got a few still open. If you guys can squeeze in, or if you have an open seat, we've got some standing. So if you guys 
I want to go ahead and have a seat. I'd like to invite you to see. sit. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dustin Persone. He's the uh, founder of Narrable. And what Narrable is, is it's, uh, it's used, it's a, it uses storytelling through images and narration to engage students and draw important higher order thinking skills. So they actually partner with the teachers and the Common Core Standards um, to, uh, to help in the classroom. So I'm going to turn it over if you guys can give a hand for Dustin. Uh, thanks for letting us come and uh, talk. Thanks out to the award winning Cuts team. Uh, we threw as much jargon as possible in that little write-up so that Brad would have to read it. Uh, so, Narrable is a storytelling platform for the education world for K-12. Um, but very basically what we do is when a uh, classroom they learn something, um, we help the students use photos, graphs, illustrations, things like that to create a story and then use their voices to convey that message. We think that storytelling is really the best way to learn. So uh, our team uh, is myself, uh, Kevin, who's here, he's our head of community, he's the one who's in the classroom, um, learning from teachers, bringing that back to help drive product development. Um, and then we work with a team um, in Bangalore, India, called Multunis. Um, and they have uh, been with us from the very beginning. They're an awesome group. Um, so they do a lot of our actual product development. Uh, our office is uh, over in the Brady District. Um, we um, were lucky enough to get to uh, share office space with the folks over at Gateway Creative. Um, they're an awesome crew. There's a couple other startups housed out of there. Um, we love being downtown. Uh, before we were in the Brady District, we were at the Forge. Loved being at the Forge, uh, getting the, there's some people here at the Forge. It's a great place. A year and a half before that, worked out in the spare bedroom of my house, which was awesome if you enjoy wearing basketball shorts all day, but not great for productivity. So, uh, at Narrowville, we believe in engaging students by finding the story in everything. And if you think back to school, everything you learn it has to do with storytelling. Even Things like math, story problems, science, their stories, history, stories, English stories, everything is a story. And the reason is because storytelling is the most natural way to learn. Uh, it involves higher order thinking skills, which Brad alluded to. So that's the big um, buzzword right now in education. That's the whole purpose of the behind um, these common core standards. It's getting students to use these things, rather than just recalling facts, they're able to know um, concepts and recall that um, and be creative. It requires active participation. You can't sit on the sideline. You have to be part of the story and, and argue in your head, wait, what, what did they say here? And I don't know if I agree with that. Um, and it enables collaboration. We don't tell stories in isolation. We tell stories together in groups, two other people, all, all part of a great piece of the storytelling process. The problem is that teachers have no time. Teachers are told all day long, you have to do this, you have to do this. Um, you have to map everything to Common Core. You have to measure everything so we know if you're, this is really happening and really working. You have to use technology, but good luck if we're gonna actually support you in that. Um, and the bottom line is you have to get your kids engaged. And uh, if you've ever stood in front of a classroom of junior high students, it is the scariest thing in the world. Uh, they are vicious. Um, so, which makes them great product testers. So how are teachers supposed to use stories? Well, Narrable, we solve that problem by saving them time and effort. We can accomplish all of these things for a teacher just by using Narrable and using storytelling in the classroom. So the most important thing is that we make it fun for students. We make it creative that they participate in the process. Junior high students don't like to be sat, you know, sit in the back of the classroom and be talked at all day. They want to participate, they want to create. So we allow that to happen through um, by them making their own stories. The other piece is that mobile rules um, that even in the classroom now, more and more teachers are using cell phones to help the learning process. So we have a piece where you can actually have a student put in their cell phone number and we'll, our computer system will call them, they can talk, record their story, and hang up and then it's automatically on the website. You don't need a microphone. We map everything to the Common Core, which we're going to skip because it's really boring. Um, <laughs> technology that actually works, shocker. Um, we've built everything in the web so it works on any device, iPad, tablet, desktop, Mac, PC, anything. Um, we believe in being the Zappos.com of education support, tech support. Um, I spent uh, an hour on the phone yesterday or doing a web a conference with a lady um, 
who was homeschooling her grandson and, and didn't know what a URL was. So we had to spend some time talking about what a link was and how to email, and but by the end, she loved Mirable and was so excited about it, and that's worth it. We're just gonna, we'll spend an hour every day doing that, no problem. Um, and then what Cabot's been working on, being in the classroom, is this iterative focus on classroom feedback. Everything we build is for teachers and by teachers, so we don't add any feature that they don't specifically request from us. So the bottom line is that school doesn't have to suck. This is Charlie, he's our mascot slash my golden retriever. Um, he's very cool winter. Um, storytelling can make school fun. Um, we believe it, we've seen it. Um, we are in 300 classrooms across 28 countries right now. Um, it's amazing to see what students create when you give them the opportunity. So that's what we're working on right now. I think I'm probably close to my six minutes, so I will take questions. Or I'm going to the call. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your um, or what's your educational background that brought you to this concept? None. <laughs> I went to school. Um, so we believe in the iterative process, um, and so we launched Narrable last December as an ancestry and family storytelling platform. Then we actually pivoted into a wedding photographer sales platform, and then after that we pivoted into education. Um, so we truly believe in going where the users tell us they want to go. Um, so uh, starting in about February, we had teachers start using Miracle. Um, and so we decided, okay, well, let's just keep an eye on this. Let's not just totally switch just because. Um, but then we had teachers start writing their own curriculum, their own how-to videos. Um, and so we, we started meeting with teachers, meeting with teachers of teachers, the pr professors of the universities who are teaching about education. Um, and realized that this is actually a much better fit than we could have ever imagined. Um, so Cabot um, taught school for a year um, as an experiment, and they ran him off. Um, but so he has got a little bit of our education background. We're actually seeking right now to hire an educator uh, to bring that expertise into the company. Right? Yeah. So how do we take the idea that we started with and turn it into where we are now? Um, I knew the most important thing when we started the company, um, or had the initial idea about three years ago, that storytelling and photos were had a really powerful combination. Um, and then we discovered that the voice really added to that. So that's our core, that's, that's who we are, is this, this idea of storytelling connects us as people, it reveals more about what we know and who we, who we understand and how we relate to other people. So it doesn't really matter what market we're in, that's a pretty universal thing. And in long term, we see narrow black and horizontal product that can be used for nonprofits, and can be used for education, and for business, and because everything we do is a story. So your pricing is really How do you scale up to the number of users that you Yeah, so Taylor knows our pricing because she was one of our first paying customers. Um, thank you. Um, so well, our pricing strategy in schools are really interesting. Um, distribution has to happen through teachers. Uh, teachers now get to choose what software they use in the classroom. Um, they get, are influenced by conferences and blogs and their peers about what tools to use. There's not as much of this top down, you have to use this. But revenue model has to go through the district. Teachers are incredibly price sensitive, as they should be. They don't have a very big budget. Um, whereas districts, actually in technology, have a huge budget um, and, and are not price sensitive. Um, so, um, for us, right now we offer a classroom account that is $50 per classroom per year, um, really as a way to add a, a, a value to what we're doing. Our long-term strategy is to work with a channel partner, uh, one of these existing curriculum companies or a, another distributor um, to actually do district sales and add our technology onto an existing platform. Uh, so that's really the, the best way in education to get to scale. What was the biggest, uh, what was the biggest Biggest surprise uh, of, of all the pivots. Um, I don't think you can really fully understand it until it happens to you. Um, the, the value of people's time and the, the harshness of the nice to have versus need to have of a product. You can create the coolest product that people will say all day long, oh, I would love that. 
Um, so our, our very beginning was this idea that you could go to your grandparents, take all their old photos, and have them talk about them, and you preserve now your family history. And who doesn't relate to that? Who doesn't have a grandparent that they wish, oh, I wish I would have had that for this grandparent or this, this person. But everyone wants that done. No one wants to do that. Um, it, we just don't have enough time. There's just not enough time in the day. Um, so that was the harsh thing for us is just because in here it makes sense doesn't mean that people are going to pay for it. Chase. What do you see as the biggest positive negative of Tulsa? So biggest positive negative of Tulsa uh, entrepreneurial community. I'm a little biased because I'm a huge, um, huge uh, proponent of the Tulsa entrepreneurial community. That's one of the reasons we moved downtown. Uh, that's why we're here today. Um, I, I, as much as I love Marable, and Marable is my passion, my other passion is, is the community here and building that community. Um, I think one of the best parts about it is that People in Tulsa, in Tulsa are just awesome. People want to help each other. Um, there's just that, that sense of community you don't get um, in Silicon Valley necessarily. Um, so that, I think, is a huge positive. So there's a lot of emphasis for people who are entrepreneurs or maybe aren't entrepreneurs but want to support. There, there's an emphasis of a willingness to help. Um, negative um, is probably just how the rest of the world sees us. Um, is every time we go to San Francisco and say, hey, we're from Oklahoma, they look at us like we're idiots. Um, why are you there? Because it's awesome, and we like tornadoes. Um, <laughs> so that's that's a hurdle that we have to uh, overcome any time we talk to somebody. They say, well, if you want to be anything, then you need to move to San Francisco. And we say, no thanks, we'll talk to somebody else. Yeah. You talked about the effect that Apple has in the last year. Can you give me an example of how it works in Iraq? Yeah, so um, yeah, I tend to do that. I tend to, get, tend to go to the, the value versus how it works. So. Um, Say a typical classroom, they do a um, project on South America. You know, it's a seventh grade geography class. Um, so they spend the lesson learning about, about South America, and then the teacher assigns each student. Now I want you to create a, a story about someone who lives in Brazil. Okay? So then they go online, and they can find photos where I'm in the middle of building a library of photos for them to use. So they can do drawings, they can do graphs and they create a linear progression, uh, a narrative of someone who lives in Brazil um, and then what, they, what their day is like. And throughout that, they bring in pieces about um, you know, what they've learned about the climate and about the culture and about the history and things like that. So what it does, and this is the high order thinking piece, is it requires them to take, well, I learned this fact, and I learned this fact, and I learned this fact, but how do I get all of these into one phrase that I have to say? Um, one thing we do, we, we encourage our teachers to not have their students script what they say. Um, so after they've uploaded the photos to Narable, um, then they can go into each photo, they can record a piece of audio. And we have them think, okay, for this photo, I'm going to have a main concept. And so their, their goal is to just speak off the cuff about that topic for 30 seconds, 60 seconds. And that's what creates the high order thinking skills. So if they're just reading a script, then it's, you might as well just write it. You know, there's really no value to it. But by them having to sit there and be like, uh, well, I think it's this, and put it together, and maybe redoing it a couple times, that's the, the piece where you start learning their comprehension but based on how they're speaking, not just what they're saying. Are they speaking quickly? Are they speaking slowly? Are they, how many times are they pausing? And things like that. It creates a more, more holistic view of how they're comprehending it. It's a pretty good explanation. You can go to narrable.com and check it out, too. It helps to see it. Yeah. Um, speed um, and luckily I, I had a great um, advisor at the very beginning said um, everything will take twice as long cost twice as much and be twice as hard as anything you can possibly imagine um, and he is absolutely right um, so it, it, it one of the things we do to help with that is that every week and then we do a short summary and then every month we do a long uh, uh, email to our investors saying, here's what we accomplished this month. Um, and that is more for me than for them because it helps me realize, oh, we actually did something this month. Because sometimes it feels like we are going so slow. It drives me crazy. Uh, so, uh, but thanks, quality just takes time. Um, not really, um, so we have a great experience with our team in India. Um, we're probably the exception and not the rule. Um, I think there's a lot of people who have some frustrating times. 
Um, our team there speaks English as their main language in the office, so whether they're talking with us or not. Um, so communication is not an issue. We do um, twice a week uh, Google Hangout calls. Um, we have one this morning, they're at 6 a.m. So they're, because of the time change, so it's kind of funky, but, um, so we, we do that, we do emails every single day. We can, I, I can pick up my phone and call them, you know, and it's really not a big deal. So, um, well, one of the things from a product standpoint that we do, and we did early on when it was very much an abstract, we're creating this out of thin air, was um, we took a dry erase board, excuse me, and a magazine, used permanent marker to trace out all these stencils, and then used um, dry erase markers to basically create a storyboard of everything we were doing. And then we just took an iPhone and videotaped ourselves talking through it. And it was a way for us to catch things and say, oh, that doesn't make sense. You know, how does this interaction work? But then they, we could upload those videos and they could go back and reference them at any time. Yeah. Um, Dustin, did you guys abandon or mothball your previous before your pivots as you used? Uh, are they still accessible or is that no longer an option? And in the future, do you have plans, since you already have the technology base, created to possibly make other consumer-based products off of your software? Yes, um, so we did not mothball um, our existing platform. So you can still, if you're a wedding photographer, you can sign up and use Mirable right now. Um, and you can pay us the $250, so we'll take it. Um, our, our, our efforts have been in the education space, or new features, um, even our marketing of, like functionality and things like that have been focused there. Um, but we still, we do believe Mirable is gonna be a horizontal platform where there are gonna be photographers that use it down the road and there are gonna be historians and ancestry people that use it. Um, so we want it to be that broad piece and the options to do that, but our efforts are in education. Mike? Talk about partnering with players in the software education space that are been successful, i.e. PowerPoint to that presentation Yeah, um, so not specifically with Prezi, but we have we have looked at um, uh, partnerships and that's actually what we're doing right now. That's the way we think we can leverage into districts the easiest and get that scalability. Um, so curriculum companies, there's a company in Mountain View called TCI, uh, there's some schools around here that use it. And they're a social studies curriculum and they are the whole platform. If you are a seventh grade US history teacher in Oklahoma and it is week three, you can log in. They will tell you, here are the slides you need to use for the week, here are the handouts you need to print off, here's the test at the end of the week. I mean, they make it easy for teachers so that teachers can focus on working with students. Um, but they're a curriculum company, and so we think we have the ability that we can come in and bring value to them as a technology and an activity that they, the students can do that is creative and high order thinking, um, they can plug into that. So there's all sorts of other um, partnerships I think we can do, both software, um, we're working on a partnership right now with DonorsChoose.org, um, they're a great uh, nonprofit that helps support uh, classrooms all over the world, um, and then we're also uh, exploring some partnerships, um, hopefully with Teach for America down the road. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question is uh, about the kind of a gaming aspect to Narrable. Um, we definitely have looked at it um, and plan on doing various amounts of gamification um, to it. We're not sure what that exactly looks like yet. Um, whether it's badges, leaderboards, all sorts of different things that we can do. Um, and, and it's really popular if you look at Minecraft and some of these other education games that are out there. I mean, it's definitely a, a very popular thing for our students. So um, hopefully someday. Yeah, Mark? Um, so it seems like, like there's, like Khan's Academy has a teacher to student dynamic that's been relatively accessible and Bill and yeah. Linda Gates. This is a student to teacher, is that what, I mean? Yeah, so like Khan Academy, and, and there's a lot of other ones like that that are, um, they're, they call them MOOCs, uh, Massive Online Open Courses, I think is what the stands for. Uh, so this idea that you can have one teacher and there are thousands of students that can access that teacher and a way to leverage that knowledge and that expertise. So Narrable, um, is a great opportunity to plug into that as the, the feedback loop of, okay, now you can have a student create something that not only teaches 
a teacher that teaches each other. Um, and that's a huge piece in education right now is this idea of flipped classroom and other jargon that we can throw around, but this idea that we're the students are participating in the process. And I think that's really key, especially for junior high students. They, they need to participate and know what's going on. Um, but we met a, another startup a couple months ago uh, called Wattpad. And they're a storytelling site based out of Montreal. They've got 18 million junior high students writing novels on their phones and reading the novels on their phones. Um, they spend an average of three and a half hours reading and writing on their, and it's just text. There's no photos, there's nothing else. They're just sitting there and I'm gonna type a chapter one of my novel, post it, get people to comment on it, and then I write another one. Um, it's pretty amazing, and what they've learned is that participation is the most important piece. By students participating and knowing that they're part of the story, whether they actually influence the story or not, it doesn't matter, but they're participating. They have 4,000 YouTube trailers user-generated content uploaded every single week uh, about the stories, you know, they're making their own movie trailers and things like that. It's pretty incredible. Yeah? So, do you ever get uh, programmers and also where do you go to get the pictures that you have to So, programmers, um, we obviously we use a, a team in India. We're working on bringing part of that team back to Tulsa. Um, it, it, that made a lot of sense for us at the very beginning because we needed to kind of outsource the CTO type role. Um, so here, I mean, the thing about Tulsa is it's all relationship based. So it's finding people who know people. And TU's got a great program. OSU's got a great program. ORU's building a great program. Um, so that's part of events like this is getting a place together where you can say, hey, I know a programmer who can help you design this. Because you may not need a whole team. You may need one person who will work at night and kind of work for equity and kind of figure out, hey, let's build this prototype and see if it works. Um, for the images for us, um, we everything is user submitted right now. So they got to find that out on YouTube or not YouTube, but Google or Flickr or whatever. Um, but we are building a library right now through a partnership with a stock photo company. Um, where we're going to have some available for students that are high quality. That answer? Yes. Cool. Um, Here and then. Are there any social applications to, like in the future, for what you guys do? So we think that definitely storytelling is a social activity. Um, it is. Well, it's why Facebook is big and why Twitter and everything is a story. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for um, organizations to engage people through the power of stories. Uh, they are, if you look at um, really anything, like hunting and fishing magazines, people want to show up, oh, here's this fish I caught, here's this thing that I did, and they're, they're wanting to interact, but they're wanting to share, hey, here's the story of how I caught that fish. So we think there's an there's a lot of user-generated content happening right now. We think there's another level that can happen that is high-quality user-generated content that fewer people are going to do. Fewer people are going to take the time to tell the story about how they caught this fish, but they, they are going to do that, and then they want to share that with other people so that they can get the reassurance and all sorts of other things. Um, so within education, we, there's going to be a social aspect where it's within the safe walled garden um, where a classroom in Georgia can talk to a classroom in Maine and say, oh, we both did projects on the Renaissance. Let's share each other's stories. But then outside of that, we think there's a, an element to it as well. Back um, are the stories or narratables, are they exportable? Is it, is it stuck within your web system? Could I make a narratable, download it, and post it on my blog or on my YouTube page? Or So uh, everything lives right now in the cloud, um, in the narrable system. There's not a download or export feature. Um, down the road, we want to oh, build that in for you, especially in the family ancestry piece, where it's like, okay, I want to I want to have ownership of my grandma's audio. Um, we do have sharing and export features where you can embed a narrable on a blog or web page. You can share it to Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, LinkedIn, email, just about anywhere. Okay, thanks everybody. We need more teachers to learn from, uh, and that's a big piece of what we're doing. We are um, trying to work with as many teachers, especially in the Tulsa area, as possible, so that we can go into the classroom and learn from them, and watch students interact with it. So if you are a teacher, know a teacher, and everyone knows a teacher, um, if you are with a nonprofit that works in education, we would love to talk with you um, about how we can do some partnerships. Um, to, we're not 
right now focused on scaling huge, we're focused on scaling deep and getting a lot of really good usage and learning how this can be a tool that's used every day or every week in the classroom that brings a lot of value. Is the scaling big can happen through a channel partner down the road. So thanks everyone. That is our, uh, that concludes our session. Real quick, again, um, we're gonna meet the same time next week, so we'd like for you guys to bring somebody, uh, even though we'll make room, if it's standing room only. Uh, we just wanna keep the momentum in bringing the entrepreneurs uh, together in Tulsa. So if you know someone you'd like to invite to this, we've got two great speakers lined up for next week, um, and we will be posting those pretty soon. Uh, OneMillionCups.com backslash Tulsa. And uh, you can request to be a speaker. Also, you can follow us on Twitter. You guys have a great day. And uh, give Justin and Katie a hand. Foolish thing.